Hair. This is Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m. seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there. I'm Eamon Holmes, and I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. Now there's a lot to come this hour, all the latest from Westminster of course, and we'll go to Kiev for the latest on the war in Ukraine, also to Brussels for reaction to that emergency NATO summit, and back at home, the spring statement, that criticism keeps growing. All that to come, but first it's the latest GB News headlines. Good afternoon, it's three o'clock. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. President Joe Biden has announced a joint game plan with the EU to reduce Europe's dependency on Russian energy. The US will provide the European Union with at least 15 billion additional cubic metres of liquefied natural gas by the end of the year. Speaking in Brussels, President Biden said the EU shouldn't be subsidising Putin's brutal attack on Ukraine. I know that eliminating r Russian gas will have costs for Europe, but it's not only the right thing to do from a moral standpoint, it's going to put us on a much stronger strategic footing. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says a humanitarian corridor will be opened out of the besieged city of Mariupol today for those with access to a car. Tens of thousands of civilians are believed to be trapped with little food, water, medicine, power or heat. 300 people were reportedly killed when Russia bombed a theatre sheltering women and children in Mariupol last week. The UN Refugee Agency says around 3.7 million people have fled Ukraine since the conflict began. The British Ministry of Defence says Ukraine has reoccupied towns and defensive positions up to 21 miles east of the capital, Kiev. It also says in the south, Russian forces heading to Odessa are being slowed by logistical problems and Ukrainian resistance. Alexander Nosichenko is a Ukrainian businessman turned soldier. He told us why he's fighting on the front line. What happens to those who cannot escape, who have no means to travel or to uh, immigrate to Europe? Those will be ultimately killed by Russians. That's crystal clear. Uh, and then a big question mark was, why was I doing this, you know, training for all these six years? Probably for the moment like this. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says the Taliban's decision to close schools to girls in Afghanistan is unjustifiable. The UK, US and Canada, along with representatives of the European Union, have condemned the decision in a joint statement. They say denying their right to an education contradicts the Taliban's previous assurances. Nargis Nehan is a former Afghan politician in Kabul. She told GB News there are millions of girls living as prisoners in the country. Living, you don't know what you're living for. You don't, you're not treated as a human being anymore. Uh, okay. You don't have access to the very, very basic rights. Even for small decisions such as going to the doctor, you have to have a male company. So as a human being, you don't have any independency. You don't have any freedom. You cannot earn for yourself. You cannot decide for yourself. And uh, the, the, the future seems very dark and bleak. And you don't see anybody around trying to help you out. 
The Transport Secretary has called for the resignation of the P&O Ferries Chief Executive. That's after Peter Hebblethwaite admitted he should have consulted unions before sacking 800 workers without notice. They're being replaced with cheaper agency staff. Coronavirus infections have risen sharply across most of the UK, with over 4.2 million people likely to have had the infection last week. The steep rise is being driven by the Omicron BA2 variant, a more transmissible form of Omicron. Northern Ireland is the only nation where infections are believed to be falling. And in Wales, more than 1,400 people have been admitted to hospital with COVID, the highest number of admissions in over a year. First Minister Mark Drakeford has announced that the legal requirement to wear a face covering in shops and on public transport will end on Monday, as well as self-isolation after a positive COVID test. The rapid spread of infections caused by BA2 means that we need to retain some of these protections in law for a little while longer. And at the same time, we will continue to issue authoritative advice to help people take those steps which protect us all. Mark Drakeford speaking there. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. Let's return to the briefing with Tom Harwood. Coming up this hour on The Briefing. One month since the war in Ukraine started as Russia keeps attacking, uh, NATO held an emergency summit yesterday in Brussels. I'll be joined by a Ukrainian MP in Kyiv and a journalist in Brussels to give us her response to the summit. Another difficult day for the Chancellor, of course. After he unveiled his spring statement on Wednesday, the criticism keeps mounting up. I'll be joined by a member of the Treasury Select Committee to help us understand how it will affect everyone. And the issues at the border of Northern Ireland continue. Would they introduce a visa-style waiver system for non-Irish residents? Well, our reporter Doogie Beatty is there. Give me your political briefing as well. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk. Or you can tweet me at gbnews. Now, we're one month into the war in Ukraine, with a number of civilians being bombed, some stranded in cities. And according to the latest UN statistics, 3.6 million people have left Ukraine. The invasion of Russia, the, the invasion that Russia has triggered, has triggered one of the biggest humanitarian crises in modern history, one not seen in Europe since the Second World War. Despite the devastation, Russia is stalling. It's yet to make significant rapid progress across any of its suspected key military objectives. And in yesterday's emergency NATO summit in Brussels, US President Joe Biden stepped up his warnings, saying that NATO will act if Russia uses chemical weapons against Ukraine. Well, joining me now from Kiev is Anna Sovson, Ukrainian member of parliament, to tell us and give us first hand exactly what the situation is on the ground. Uh, welcome to the programme. Thank you so much for making time uh, for us this afternoon. Firstly, can you just give us a little sense of what the feeling is in Kyiv right now? Of course, the Russians have not yet incurred with boots on your city, but they have been dropping bombs. Exactly. Uh, well, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, the bombs are very real. Just literally five minutes ago, while waiting to go on air, I could hear explosions uh, in some distance from from my home. But still, it is uh, really close. <laughs> it is uh, really, really close. And we are hearing them from time to time. Uh, actually, this morning I was talking to my uh, friend uh, who's staying with me here, and she said, well, it's been so quiet that it's actually unusual, because for the whole morning we didn't hear an explosion. Explosions. Well, now we are hearing them right now here. But overall, despite the bombings, we are seeing that the Ukrainian army is doing a good job in terms of pushing Russians further from the city. So they're not as close as they were a week ago, two weeks ago, which is, of course, given us hope in terms of, of the situation here in Kiev. Of course, the situation in several other cities, primarily in Mariupol, is, is completely different. And that, that is just a disaster what is happening here. But here in Kiev, I would say that the feeling, the general feeling is better than it was two or three weeks ago. 
That is remarkable that with the numbers difference, with the equipment difference, the Ukrainian army is able to push back the Russians from its capital city. That's a, a remarkable moment of hope, I suppose. I, I'm just trying to get a sense here of, of the situation in Kiev. How many people have stayed behind versus what sort of proportion in your estimations uh, have left? Uh, well, first of all, a short comment on the numbers. Of course, the numbers of Russian army are much bigger, but Putin is not just fighting against Ukrainian army here. He is actually fighting against the whole of Ukrainian people. Because Ukrainian army is not that big, but you have to realize that many, many people, thousands of people have signed up for territorial defense, which is separate from the army. And I think it's more than 100,000 people who signed up for that. Then we also have the National Guard, the, the National uh, Police, uh, the uh, special forces who are all fighting together. So, so uh, even in terms of numbers, uh, we actually, uh, you know, not as bad because again, we are fighting all of us. Uh, all people are resisting, not just the army. And that is something that Putin did not envision because in his understanding of the world, people do not matter. But what we are proving here in Ukraine is that people matter, they have a voice, and they are willing to, you know, to take their part in terms of resisting uh, Russians. And that is why they cannot uh, uh, proceed here on the ground, not just because of the army, but because uh, also regular people are, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails or reporting simply to the army where they have seen Russian tanks. And that is a great help to the army itself. So that is one of the important issues of the success. Um, so so uh, that is important important to understand uh, here on the ground. And, and that is why we are truly hopeful uh, about how the situation will proceed. It's interesting because with every success that the Ukrainian people have against this Russian army that seems to be beset with issues, although of course it is right to acknowledge the Russian army is still encroaching, particularly uh, wreaking some, some devastating consequences on, on cities like Mariupol. Um, it does bring into question whether it is right to have negotiations with the Russian government. Uh, in your view, should Ukraine be talking to its aggressor? Well, in my view, we need to be talking, but I'm rather pessimistic about whether we shall be able to achieve any solution to this. I still believe that the solution will be military, unfortunately. I'm saying that with, uh, it's not an easy th thing to say for myself, uh, but I am afraid that this is the only way to proceed. Because in order to have a diplomatic solution, in order to make a diplomatic deal, you need to trust your counterpart. And I think everyone listening to this realizes that not a single person in the world can trust what Putin promises to do. Because we have heard just a week before he attacked us, he was saying that he is not planning to attack Ukraine. Uh, just uh, 10 days ago, his uh, foreign minister said that they did not attack Ukraine. So, you know, when they are lying all the time, making any deals with them is, well, at least to say naive. Uh, and that is why I'm not very hopeful in terms of um, achieving specific results, uh, or rather strategic results. Uh, however, we do manage to get some results from those talks, particularly in terms of humanitarian corridors in some of the cities. Unfortunately, not from Mariupol, but at least from some of the cities. That is probably the only uh, you know, practical result of the talks taking place. But other than that, uh, you know, the, the demands that Putin, uh, that Putin is, is, uh, is claiming are unreasonable. We would never accept that. And just making a deal with the enemy, it's like, uh, I don't know, like uh, making a deal between uh, Hitler and the Jews at the beginning of World War II. Uh, now, from the historical perspective, it's, it's clear that it wouldn't have been possible. So I think uh, the world needs to realize that what we're dealing with right now is the Hitler of our times, and we need to, uh, to respond uh, respectively. Certainly, and thinking about the absolute barbarism that Russia is raining down on so much of your country right now, one of the big concerns of NATO leaders uh, in the last day or so has been this renewed attention on what Russia may be planning in terms of chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction. We've, of course, heard their uh, awful disinformation about so-called biolabs and the rest of it that they've spoken about in Georgia. They've spoken about just about everywhere where they want to uh, advance their own chemical warfare. How concerned are you about that threat? 
that threat of weapons of mass destruction potentially being deployed in your country? And what would you like to see the West do were it to happen? Well, uh, we are, of course, extremely concerned. We are hearing news from the Russian side that the Russian soldiers have been provided with the antidotes against some chemical uh, weapon. So for us, that is a clear sign that they realize that their soldiers might be in place of danger against chem uh, of chemical weapon uh, attack. So of course, we are extremely concerned. And uh, that is why we want the whole world to realize that this is the real danger. There were some promises made uh, yesterday during NATO summit uh, and some uh, uh, claims to put in that uh, in case he tries to use that there will be a very tough response but I think it is important for the West to understand that promising a tough response is not the same as delivering a tough response and so far Putin understand that the West did not deliver a very tough response to all the atrocities that he has uh, started here in Ukraine so what I am concerned about is that Putin will not take those threats of response seriously given the history of the Western response to the war in Ukraine so far. Uh, we, we are still uh, very disappointed, let's put it this way, that we didn't get enough help in terms of establishing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. We are not asking for NATO troops on the ground, but we're just asking for the jets. We are just asking for the air defense system so that we can cover our skies ourselves. But even that was not provided. So what I'm concerned with is that Putin will realize that this can be just a game on the Western side and will not take those threats seriously given the history of, of the reaction to this uh, war so far. Well, no doubt the eyes of the world will be on what happens from now. But for now, Inna Sovson, Ukrainian member of parliament, thank you very much for joining us here on the briefing on GB thank News. You. Really appreciate your words this afternoon. Now, of course, yesterday Brussels played host to an emergency NATO summit alongside G7 and EU meetings. NATO members agreed to strengthen their defences in the east and Britain announced further arms supplies to Ukraine too. Well, joining me from Brussels now is Jack Parrock, a Brussels correspondent journalist out there. Welcome to the programme. First of all, can you just run through exactly what has been agreed that is new? What further developments did we learn out of yesterday? Well, yesterday we knew that NATO was going to give uh, 40,000 additional troops to countries in the east of the military alliance, in Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and also Hungary for new battle groups. But I think probably there's been some bigger announcements as far as the European Union and, 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 uh, and the US have been concerned. We've heard... We had a joint press conference earlier this morning from Ursula von der Leyen and Joe Biden, so the European Commission president and the president of uh, the United States, obviously. And they've basically agreed to ramp up the imports of liquefied natural gas from the United States into the European Union by at least 15 billion cubic metres annually with the intention of trying to raise that to 50 billion cubic metres annually in the coming years. Now, this is an intention to try and wean Europe off Russian gas, which is something that they say they want to do at least by two thirds by the end of this year. But that's going to be extremely difficult, bearing in mind that actually R Russian gas imports into the EU amount to somewhere in the region of 150 billion cubic metres a year. So we're talking about sort of 10, 15% of the gap to be filled by the United States. But this is also all in the context of Russian President Vladimir Putin saying, from now on, he is only going to sell and honour contracts of gas in rubles, not in euros or dollars. So that's throwing a real big spanner in the works for the Europeans. Certainly, it's so interesting thinking about the dynamics that may well knock on to the UK. Of course, we only import around three or just over three percent of our gas from Russia as things stand. We're mainly importers from the United States of America and Qatar. I wonder what the consequences of the Europeans buying a lot more from the Americans will be. Could that potentially ease our supplies? Might that affect the United Kingdom? Or was that not really in the discussion? Well, I think the issue at the moment is around pricing, obviously, and that could have a knock-on effect. This agreement between the EU and the US could ramp up prices. We didn't know, they didn't explain exactly how much they're going to be paying for this gas. 
But obviously, if, if the, the supply chains come coming into ports in Europe, that could affect uh, the, the, the supplies into the United Kingdom. The, the European Union is about 40 percent re reliant on Russian gas at the moment. Some countries like Bulgaria, for instance, are almost exclusively reliant. And there has been su a suggestion that if there were any full energy sector sanctions from the European Union against the Russian gas sector, that countries like that could opt out. The US and Britain have been much, much harder on this regarding their sanctions on the energy sector. But it is less painful, as you say, uh, for those countries uh, to, 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 to impose those kind of sanctions than it is for the Europeans. So the Europeans are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place on this issue, and they're really scouting around now. In fact, the foreign policy chief of the EU, who's been attending this, is going to Qatar in the, in the next couple of days to try and negotiate some gas deals there. And again, this starts to build up that competition, which could have a big effect, effect on the British market as well. Well, turning now to the more political side of this, of course, this was uh, Boris Johnson's first trip back to Brussels in a little while. There were a number of claims and counterclaims on social media as to how warmly or otherwise he was received. Although I have to say, I think that one of the videos doing the rounds wasn't particularly representative because he did, of course, shake the hands of all the other leaders and have some chit chat too. Uh, what's your perspective in terms of how Boris Johnson was received at the two events he attended? Well, so he attended, as you say, the NATO summit, and there was this video of him sort of lingering a bit lonely. We'll say that you can pretty much always find a video of some leader looking a little bit awkward during during any kind of summit, you know, where they're looking and other people are shaking hands and stuff. I think, uh, you know, he obviously wasn't wasn't in attendance at the EU summit as uh, the, the US president was, and there was a lot made of that. But there were also lots of other NATO leaders that, that, that didn't attend. And also the Japanese prime minister who attended the G7 also wasn't wasn't heavily involved in the, in, in the EU meetings either. I think there's uh, no doubt that, you know, Boris Johnson isn't a particularly popular figure here in Brussels due to every Everything that has gone on with Brexit and that continue, despite the war in Ukraine, there is obviously a continuing clash of heads over many issues regarding the Brexit deal uh, here in Brussels. But I think broadly, uh, from a British perspective, uh, Boris managed to get his his points across and, and also announced those additional uh, military support for Ukraine, which is something that he would have want to be, wanted to be highlighted. And I think it, it kind of was while he was here, here at the NATO summit. Potentially more brought back home from Brussels than from Saudi Arabia just a few weeks ago. Uh, well, it's, uh, I suppose we'll need to wait to see just how much more this develops. But for now, Jack Parrock, of course, Brussels correspondent out there in Belgium, thank you very much for joining us here on the briefing this afternoon. Now, after the break, we'll be having a look at the spring statement and how it's not been universally well received. That's after this. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood, and every weekday we bring you The Briefing live from 9.30am. The stories, analysis and live debate that you need to hear. Quite right, uh, uh, Tom, of course. Was this something that had been considered at all? Difficult to answer. Gas-guzzling helicopters circling. Noise is being made here! Joe Biden walking out. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, Monday to Friday, 9.30am on GB News. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. But quite often, they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. Welcome back. Now, the spring statement was delivered on Wednesday by Chancellor Rishi Sunak, announcing significant measures including a 5p cut in fuel duty, the raising of the national insurance threshold by £3,000 to match income tax, and a pledge to cut the basic rate of income tax from 20p to 19p in the pound before the end of this parliament. Now, while some of these measures have been welcomed, the Chancellor has also faced criticism that he has simply not gone far enough. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Conservative MP Kevin Hollinrake. Uh, welcome to the programme. I suppose the Chancellor Thanks, has been reportedly a little bit uh, taken aback by some of the criticism of his statement. No doubt one made against really tough times internationally, but it hasn't landed all that well in the papers, has it? Well, people will always say, whatever you do, you've not gone far enough. And of course, I understand that. And lots of people are feel, feeling huge pressure from the rising living costs. But <clears throat> there's only so much you can do to, to mitigate that, of course, because this is very broad based. Everybody's suffering from this, of course. And these are international issues. The inflation uh, is principally being driven by energy costs and supply chain prices, which are not within the Chancellor's gift. So he's got to try and provide some support, which he collects from the taxpayer, of course. Uh, the government has no money, so it's got to collect money to then distribute to other people in need. And of course, um, you know, some of those people are the same people. Taxpayers are in need uh, as well. So if you tax people more to, to distribute that money to other places, um, there's, that's that's pretty complex thing to have to do and doesn't really solve the problem in many ways. So. Of course, he's, he did a lot in terms of energy support, support for for the rising energy costs earlier in in, uh, in this uh, this in the spring, um, three hundred and fifty pounds per household, which was very important. And then, as you say, the national insurance uh, reduction, which again is about another three hundred and thirty pounds uh, in terms of that ra rise in threshold. And of course, the fuel duty cut, which is about a hundred pound for, for each household. So these are quite significant uh, measures that have. Cost, cost him and the taxpayer quite a lot of money. They certainly have, although it does seem to me that with one hand, the Chancellor may be taking less, but with the other, he seems to be taking more. Of course, this threshold rate rise comes against a tax cut. So the taxes are still net going up. It's just affecting slightly fewer people than before. Is, is there not another option here? You mentioned the government can only spend by correct, collecting tax directly. The other option is, of course, to borrow. And we know that this Chancellor is very borrowing averse. But in some circumstances, for example, right now with the crisis we're in, might it not make more sense to, in the short term, cut taxes? take on a bit more debt and grow the economy out of that situation in the medium term? 
Well, that was tried in the 1980s and resulted in, or the 70s actually, and resulted in having to go to the IMF, as I remember. I mean, we've already borrowed an awful lot Taxes of money. Taxes in the you know, 1970s, did they? Sorry? I don't think they cut taxes in the 1970s. They, they did. They, the tried to, they tried to spend their way out of a recession, if you remember. And Jim Callaghan, he, he said exactly that. They tried to spend their way out of a recession back in the 70s. It's a very difficult thing to do. We owe, and that's the reason we owe two point, one of the reasons we owe £2.3 trillion already. I mean, the government will borrow about £120 billion pounds this year, um, even, even before he, he, put, he puts extra support into the economy of the way you describe. So, yes, yeah, some people say you can borrow forever endlessly. I don't subscribe to that. Neither does, does the Chancellor. But I think so you're having to balance these spending decisions very carefully and try not to put that, that greater burden back on the taxpayer to pay for it. So it's a difficult balancing act. Of course, the opposition and often the media will say you've not done enough. I, I, I can understand that. And for lots of people, this is pretty serious issues in terms of the cost of living crisis. But as I say, there's been a significant amount of support already. I'm sure the Chancellor is going to look at this and try and and he may well uh, do more uh, as this situation develops, depending on what happens to inflation and energy prices. But um, he has done a lot. You cannot take that away from him. Certainly, and no one could deny the international situation, of course. Inflation in the UK running really quite painfully high, but lower than in the US, and about the same rate as in the EU. All parts of the Western developed world are facing similar sorts of issues. I wonder, though, what can be done about one particular issue with regard to the United Kingdom, and that's the sclerotic rate of growth projected in the future. No one can deny that last year the UK was the fastest growing G7 economy, something that this government can rightly be proud of. However, going into the future, that rate drops down and down and down. And we know that it's economic growth rather than high taxes that has the potential to fund public services into the future. What can be done to raise that growth? Yes, absolutely right. And I'm sure you listened to the spring statement very carefully. And the Chancellor did talk about this. And he said, although we're spending money in terms of research and development uh, in the public sector, so the government spending is quite high, and very high in relative terms, in historic terms, but still the private sector is not investing as much as it could business investment generally and in terms of research and development, which is where that kind of dynamic growth comes from. So this is what he's looking at now, how we incentivize business to invest more, to become more productive. That's one thing. The other thing, of course, is large parts of this country have been mass massively underinvested in for many, many decades, not least the north of England, where, as you know, I, I represent. So we need to make sure we do more infrastructure investment in the north. That's key to productivity and prosperity. Um, more, better skills training. Again, the government is investing historic amounts in these areas to try and get the country firing on all cylinders, not just the London and the South East being the biggest contributor, but also other parts of the country too. And I'm massively a supporter of that. And of course, the chance is saying he'll be bring forward some of those proposals for greater investment as well in the months to come. I suppose we'll need to look at those very carefully. But for now, Kevin Hollenrake, thank you very much for joining us here on The Briefing this afternoon. You're welcome. Well, the Fixed-Term Parliament Act is obsolete from yesterday. I'll be speaking to Craig Prescott about what this means and what those changes actually affect. Plus, Tony Diver, the Whitehall correspondent for The Telegraph, will join me to round up the stories of this week and look ahead to next. But first, it's your news update. Thank you, Tom. It's 3.32. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. President Joe Biden has announced a joint game plan between the US and the EU that will reduce Europe's dependency on Russian energy. As part of the plan, the US will provide the EU with at least 15 billion additional cubic metres of liquefied natural gas by the end of the year. Coronavirus infections have risen sharply across most of the UK, with over 4.2 million people likely to have had the infection last week. The steep rise is being driven by the BA2 variant, a more transmissible form of Omicron. Northern Ireland is the only nation where infections are believed to be falling. 
In Wales, the legal requirement to wear a face covering in shops and on public transport will end on Monday, as well as self-isolation after a positive COVID test. All legal restrictions were set to be removed, but First Minister Mark Drakeford says rising transmission and hospitalisations mean some have to stay. And the boss of dairy giant Arla says the price of a pint of milk is likely to go up as farmers struggle with rising costs of feed, fertiliser and fuel. In the last 10 years, consumer prices have gone up 26%, whereas the cost of milk has dropped by 7%. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. It's back to the briefing with Tom Harwood in just a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now, the Fixed-Term Parliament Act was finally scrapped this week. The legislation, brought in by the Clegg Cameron Coalition Government in 2011, was designed to solidify the length of each parliament to five years, unless, of course, the House of Commons voted early for an early election, but that would have to be by a two-thirds majority, a peculiar quirk in a majoritarian system. Beforehand, Prime Ministers had the right to call an early election within each five-year period. However, since the inception of this Act, we've seen three general elections in the space of five years, and a period of gridlock where MPs clashing over Brexit refused to vote in favour of facing the electorate on three separate occasions. So what's the constitutional and political legacy of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, and what new powers are going to replace it? Well, joining me to discuss this is the Director at the Centre for Parliament and Public Law at the University of Winchester, Craig Prescott. Welcome to the programme. Now, a lot of people are delighting in the fact that the Fixed Term Parliament Act is gone. Why did certain sections of political life hate it so much? Uh, good afternoon. It was quite clear that this became a complicating factor when it came to um, Brexit in particular. And what it did was it, al it allowed um, particularly the, the Labour Party to uh, perhaps constantly shift its position uh, when it came to Brexit. So the government sort of went and negotiated a deal Perhaps it, it didn't necessarily, um, some on the right of the Conservative Party didn't like the deal, but perhaps it achieved quite a lot of what Labour wanted to do, but Labour still opposed the Brexit deal. Um, but then the other issue, well, OK, if the 
government doesn't have a majority in the commons for its sort of main purpose, then ordinarily you would have a motion of no confidence. Well, the Fixed Term Parliament Act interfered with this and it allowed um, you know, MPs to sort of try and keep the government in office but not vote with it on its main issue of the day. And as you said, we ended up with gridlock. But then holding an election to resolve this gridlock also became a bit more complicated. So it it just sort of added a different element to that whole Brexit process and, and perhaps an unwelcome element. Um, and the left, sort of left the government there. Returned. It left the government there in office, but not in power, as many people uh, said, a very peculiar paralysis that befell our political system. Although it has to be said, an election did eventually come within that term. But that's because more than two thirds of parliament voted for it, something that's very peculiar in our system, having these threshold votes. Of course, in constitutional systems where or where Congress or Parliament or whatever the legislative body is, isn't sovereign, um, votes using super majorities sort of make sense because there's a higher authority. But I suppose it's never really made sense to use a super majority in the case of our Parliament because that law could be wiped out with a simple majority of a one-line piece of legislation. Well, and that's actually how we got the 2019 general election, because, yes, as you say, the Fixed Term Parliament Act allowed for an early election if two-thirds of MPs voted in favour of, of an early election. But the problem we had in 2019 was that we didn't reach that two-thirds majority. Indeed, uh, on some of the votes, the Labour Party abstained on this, and so you just could never reach that 66% threshold. That was overridden by passing an ordinary piece of legislation, which just required a simple majority. So it was always the case that MPs, if they wanted to hold an early election, could have done by a simple majority, by passing legislation, setting out when the next election would be held, which is actually what happened eventually in 2019 and showed ultimately how futile that 66% threshold was in that it doesn't work in our system of parliamentary sovereignty where the highest form of, of majority we need is a simple majority in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. Scratching my brains, trying to think if there's any other piece of legislation that demands a two-third majority for anything. I, I, I'm not sure there is. Could this mark the beginning and the end of the demand for supermajorities at Westminster? I think, you know, this has been an experiment and I think it's one that we're unlikely to return to anytime soon. Um, you can get all sorts of odd um, consequences from a supermajority. Um, in particular, you can oppose by abstaining. And so it makes the whole process of voting politically more complicated. And, you know, politicians, MPs sort of jockeying for position, taking different stances. Um, as we saw with Brexit, it just adds a, a, a complicating factor. And as opposed to the traditional yes, no, simple majority approach. Um, and so I don't see that there's much in going for more super majorities in other pieces of legislation, at least on, a, on an ad hoc basis. We'd have to think about this much more fundamentally. Yes, yeah, certainly. It seems like that's a very different sort of system to the parliamentary system that we enjoy in this country. And perhaps uh, by scrapping this piece of legislation, we're returning to that sense of parliamentary sovereignty that has uh, presided over so much of political debate over the last few years. I'm afraid we've run to the end of this conversation. But for now, thank you very much for joining us there. Uh, of course, Craig Prescott, the director of the Centre for Parliament and Public Law at the University of Winchester. Now to Northern Ireland, and a number of explosions have been heard in Belfast this afternoon. Earlier, the Republic of Ireland's Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney, was forced to abandon a public event in Belfast amid a security alert. Pictures show the moment that Mr Coveney's address to a peace-building event was interrupted 
and was abruptly ushered from the room. Well, joining me now is our Northern Ireland reporter, Doogie Beatty. Uh, Doogie, what more do we know about exactly the cause of these explosions? Well, we know that uh, Simon Coveney has been very heavily involved in the protocol talks in, uh, in and around Europe. He was the ex tonister he was tipped to be the Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland. He is now the Foreign Affairs Minister. Uh, unionists and loyalists uh, are not very fond of him because of the protocol. We actually reported back in October that the PUP, the Progressive Unionist Party, the political wing that represented the uh, loyalist paramilitaries during the Good Friday Agreement, had said that they were withdrawing their support for the Good Friday Agreement because of the protocol and no consent. Uh, the Article 6, the Act of the Union, had been changed without consent. Now, Simon Coveney came to visit uh, and do this speech in a monastery less than 500 yards away from a very, very loyalist area. Uh, and what has happened, I, I don't think we need to be policemen ourselves or police chiefs to know where the focus of their investigation is going to be. A couple of things on that, I suppose, is uh, for myself, is uh, we are looking to find out who claims this. And number two, if it was a viable device, that is probably the most worrying, if it was a viable device and not some sort of pipe bomb. So we're expecting these explosions were controlled explosions, demolishing something that the police discovered. Thankfully, no one hurt as far as we understand. I, I, I wonder how much this changes the political discussion. It's been awful to see uh, in this part of the United Kingdom, in Northern Ireland, for the last few years, so much of politics has been uh, decided by threats of violence, particularly from uh, one side, from the uh, Irish Republican side. That seemed to dominate so much of the talks over, uh, over Brexit and indeed formed the protocol in and of itself. I I wonder if this potentially might teach us a lesson that bending to violence from either direction is not a wise move. Well, it's exactly as it was. I mean, I spoke with the PUP at the time and they said, well, Leo Varadka went to, to Brussels with a, a picture of a blown up border post in his pocket and said, if we have a, a, a border on the island of Ireland, where I am standing right now, actually, this is Flurry Bridge. If we have a border in the island of Ireland, this will happen. So when you when you show the threat of violence wins, well, it, it does go there. But I have to say, and I, the... Um, unionist um, politicians here have been pressing very, very hard into these areas to tell uh, these paramilitaries, please don't engage in anything. You'll only weaken our argument. Please don't. Uh, first of all, they said that uh, Lord Frost was going to do the job for them. Then Liz Truss was going to sort things out. Uh, yesterday was the, sort of the last day of what is left of Stormont. Of course, it collapsed as an executive because the First Minister withdrew over the protocol. And the ghost uh, executive that was left in place, yesterday the last laws went through of that. So we are now in the election period. How much of this will play out? And it is widely rumoured that unionists do not even want to take part in these elections. Mm, that's remarkable, but I suppose we won't see a, a, a summing up of this process, of this protocol discussions until after those elections, potentially. Well, I, I know you'll be on the case, Doogie Beatty. I'm afraid we've run to the end of this segment, but thank you very much for joining us there from the border of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Well, now we have uh, had a full week full of political stories. The spring statement being delivered by the Chancellor, who was criticised. Uh, also, those falling living standards, the inflation we've seen. The boss of PO gave an explosive testimony yesterday to a joint committee when he admitted to MPs that he broke the law by not consulting workers. He even said he'd do the same again if he had to. And of course, the Prime Minister has, of course, been abroad. NATO held an emergency meeting too. Uh, it's been a very busy week. But of course, there's more to come. Well, joining me to dissect it all is Tony Diver, the Whitehall correspondent for The Telegraph. Uh, welcome to the programme, Tony. I suppose, first of all, we'll need to start off with the reaction to the Chancellor's statement, because it hasn't been as rosy as potentially the Treasury were expecting. 
No, that's right. And the big test for Rishi Sunak this week was, is he able to do something which reassures people about the economic situation with what's going on in Ukraine, uh, with rising inflation, with energy bills going up? Uh, was it enough to reassure, on one hand, the public who are concerned about their own household finances, and on the other side, reassure Conservative MPs who are worried about the cost to the public finances, the amount of money being spent by the Treasury? Uh, so it was a pretty fine line to walk. I, I spent most of yesterday talking to Tory MPs and trying to gauge the reaction. Um, I would say on the whole, the reaction is it, it's been pretty good for MPs. People are generally quite pleased with this. But uh, of course, on both sides, there are MPs who are, who are worried either about the finances of uh, the country as a whole or their own constituents who, who will be struggling this year. Yes, it seems that there was, it was never going to be an easy statement to deliver against the international backdrop that we've seen right now. But there seem to be some fairly pertinent uh, lines, particularly from the opposition benches, these calls for uh, a windfall tax, for example, on energy firms. The fact that this statement didn't address energy directly, of course, we'd heard about energy uh, back in uh, in January, and we will no doubt hear more about it next week as well. The fact that it wasn't specifically addressed in this statement, do you think that would be an issue? Well, I mean, the Treasury says that the whole point about energy bills is that there is a price cap. There's a reason a price cap was introduced in 2019 for a reason. Uh, and we know that it's already going up next month. It's going up by £693. So the Treasury says, well, after April, those energy bills are going to be capped. We've basically done everything that we can do to help people uh, right now. And it's possible that it will go up again. The Office of Budget Responsibility thinks it'll go up by another 40% in October. And the Treasury is keeping its powder dry until that happens. But yes, you're right. I mean, the charge from Labour, politically, obviously, is, well, the Chancellor's not doing anything about the huge profits being raked in by oil companies who are benefiting from these increased prices and from the conflict that's going on in Ukraine. Um, and at the same time, there are people there who are struggling to pay those bills. Labour says to the Chancellor, well, whose side are you on? I suppose we need to wait to see uh, October for the results of that. But the other big event uh, within Parliament this week was, of course, the boss of P&O, who uh, appeared in front of a joint committee um, and actually corroborated a, a claim that the Prime Minister made at Prime Minister's Questions that a lot of people questioned at the time whether or not what P&O did was actually illegal. Well, he seemed to pretty easily admit that it was. Yes, he did. And I think that has vindicated the government's response to this crisis, which is from the very beginning to say that it will be taking the claims of illegality very seriously. Uh, and today, both the Prime Minister and the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, have said that that boss should resign for what happened. And it's a little bit complicated here, which is why it's taken us a while to get to this result so we know what's actually going on. Uh, on the day that it happened, of course, Number 10 just said that they were looking into it and uh, they would try and find out whether or not the law had been broken as fast as they could. Uh, there's a few things going on here. There is the fact that firms are meant to notify the Secretary of State if they sack a, a large number of people, which it doesn't appear happened. Uh, they're also meant to notify their workers in advance, have a consultation period. It doesn't appear that that happened either. And then you've got the fact that it seems what p and have done is hired in a lot of foreign workers to work for less than the UK minimum wage. And they've got around that by flying the Cypriot flag from their ships, uh, which means that they're not technically under UK law. Now, Grant Chaps has called that a loophole. And he said the government will bring legislation next week to try and close any loopholes that exist and to prevent this sort of thing from happening. And so yeah, I think we've seen we've seen it rare that you see a Conservative government come down quite so strongly on a business on labour practices. But I think the response this week has been incredibly firm. It's remarkable also at Prime Minister's questions to see the Prime Minister quote some uh, pro-worker legislation brought in under a Conservative government in the 1990s. Uh, it was a political uh, blow there for Keir Starmer, who seemed to be a little bit on the back foot. Um, although let's move this conversation on now to international affairs. Of course, it's been an international trip for the Prime Minister yesterday uh, in Brussels uh, for two out of three meetings. Just how significant is it that, there was, that he didn't attend that EU meeting. Was that a snub or is that simply the reality that the UK doesn't really have that much to do with EU affairs anymore? Well, I think the simple fact of it is a lot of this stuff is being coordinated between EU member states. And, and we can see, for instance, that this week it looked like the EU was setting up its own disaster relief fund, its own fund for rebuilding Ukraine after the war was finished. 
um, and that will be an EU-wide thing, which the UK won't be part of. So there are plenty of those sorts of decisions, which just purely procedurally now, the UK is no longer involved with. Um, now, clearly, there will be people on the EU side who will be quite pleased to see that the Great Britain has been excluded from these discussions because uh, it's felt still by a lot of EU diplomats that Britain was wrong to leave the European Union and should be punished for it. Uh, but no, I would say on the whole, I think the diplomatic discussions about what's happening in Ukraine and the sort of severity of that situation uh, probably override some of that anti-UK sentiment and perhaps some, even some of the anti-EU sentiment on our side. And it's fair to say, of course, that the Prime Minister was involved in many other meetings and discussions, even informal ones with uh, leaders as they arrived. But of course, NATO has taken a firm but potentially unclear stance about what they will do uh, if the Russians were to deploy uh, uh, chemical weapons in Ukraine. Uh, the President of the United States making a veiled threat. What, what, what do you make of the words of Joe Biden? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Biden seems to suggest that, that the use of chemical weapons would be a red line. Uh, he went a lot further than Boris Johnson did in that press conference yesterday, which followed the NATO meeting. Uh, Boris Johnson stressing that there would be no need for the UK to, uh, to put boots on the ground uh, and that suggesting basically that it wouldn't be a red line. Now, the thing is that any action that's taken by the NATO alliance does have to be taken collectively. Uh, if, if the Americans were to put boots on the ground in Ukraine, and Russian forces were to retaliate, that would count uh, as a breach of the collective protection agreement that these states have. And so all of the other NATO allies would be drawn into it. So yes, I mean, it's a little bit worrying to see that on both sides of the Atlantic, two of the key members of NATO, the UK and the US, taking a different stance on one of the biggest questions of this conflict. Boris Johnson, of course, condemned the, any use of chemical weapons and the suggestion that they could be used. Uh, but didn't seem to say what we would do next. Now, mm. the question, I suppose, is, is it, is it sensible to give away what your tactics in a situation like that would be in a press conference, uh, or is it better to keep, keep your powder dry? I don't know. That's uh, perhaps one for the diplomats to tell us. Potentially. And of course, we didn't give them much uh, firm uh, response back in 2014 either when chemical weapons were last deployed. But uh, I suppose we'll need to wait and see. It's a horrible thing to think that we'll need to wait and see about. But I suppose we will. That is, uh, I'm afraid, all we've got time for on The Briefing today. Tony, thank you for joining us there. Tony Diver of The Telegraph. You've been watching The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. I'm back on Monday at 9.30. Next up, it's Nana Raquir. But for now, I'll leave you with your weather forecast. And I hope it looks a little sunny for everyone this weekend. Hello, I'm Luke Meyer with your weather. And if you like dry, warm and sunny weather, we've got plenty more of that to come as we go through this weekend. Now, the reason for that is high pressure firmly in charge of our weather. It's sat across the map and it's not going anywhere very quickly over the next few days, certainly through the rest of Friday and into the weekend. This high pressure will be holding on bringing with it very light winds as well. So through the rest of this evening, plenty of sunshine to enjoy to end the day and then clear skies for most of us overnight will mean it will turn quite chilly in places. We have got some mist and fog patches forming in some spots and there will be some wet weather affecting Shetland, but away from that, it's largely clear skies and temperatures plummeting down. So we will see a touch of frost as we start the day on Saturday. But 